Hello, it's Metacosis Perfectionalis. Welcome back to my chemistry quick review playlist. Every 10 videos we celebrate by having a special video just for chemistry questions or problems and answers. Today we have 18 of these, so bring a piece of paper and a pen and let's go to town. Let me know in the comments how many questions did you answer correctly. Starting by question 83, because the previous questions were in previous videos in this chemistry quick review playlist. In the compound below, what's the least electronegative element? Please pause and try to answer it yourself. What is electronegativity? It's the ability to attract electrons. And if you remember my discussion on the periodic trends, as you go downwards, electronegativity decreases. But if you go up, electronegativity increases. And if you go rightwards, across a period, electronegativity also goes up. Remember, what is the most electronegative atom? Answer, fluorine. So if I'm going to the right, towards fluorine, electronegativity increases. And if I'm going upwards, towards fluorine, electronegativity increases. But if I'm going down, away from fluorine, then it decreases. Which means fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine, chlorine is more electronegative than bromine, and bromine is more electronegative than iodine. So of these options, what's the most electronegative? Fluorine. How about fluorine versus carbon? Well, if I'm going to the right, electronegativity increases, so carbon has lower electronegativity than fluorine. Oh, and by the way, you do not need to look at the periodic table to know the least electronegative element, because by definition, if this is a properly written Lewis structure, then the least electronegative has to be the central atom, which makes carbon the correct answer. Next, draw the Lewis dot structures for the following. Fluorine molecule, chlorine molecule, oxygen molecule, nitrogen molecule, and water compound. Pause and do it. And here are the answers. Fluorine molecule, or F2. Let's count. Normally, how many electrons exist in the valence shell of fluorine? If you say seven, you're absolutely correct. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because each covalent bond represents two shared electrons. And the other fluorine also has eight, so both of them are octet. Everything is hunky-dory. Chlorine is very similar because both of these, fluorine and chlorine, are halogens. They exist in the same group, group 17, in the periodic table. Oxygen molecule. Normally, oxygen has six electrons in the valence shell. So here's one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, which means we have a double covalent bond so that this is octet and this is octet. Nitrogen molecule. Nitrogen is before oxygen. It has five valence electrons. In order for me to go from five to eight, I need extra three. So I'm going to share three and you will share three. So together we are octets. So let's count for this atom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I am octet and I am octet as well. For the water compound, what do we have here? We have a bent molecular structure. Lone pair, lone pair. If you want to know why water is bent, please watch my previous video titled Vesper Theory. Next, do you expect the molecular shape of SCL2 to be bent? Yes or no? Pause. And the answer is yes. Why? Look at sulfur in the periodic table. It's just below oxygen. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Oh, so it's just like oxygen with hydrogen in the water molecule. Precisely. How many valence electrons does sulfur have? Answer, six. It will make a bond with this chlorine atom and a bond with this chlorine atom. So here is one, two, three, four, leaving me with five, six, seven, eight. Since we have lone pairs, therefore, angle distortion. And don't forget that lone pairs lead to what? Reduction in the ideal angle, distortion in the shape. Here we have two lone pairs, and the greater the number of lone pairs, the greater the reduction in the ideal angle. What's the ideal angle? Well, how many groups do I have? Here is one group, second group, third group, fourth group. I have four groups, so the ideal angle should be 109.5. However, thanks to the presence of the lone pairs, 
I got a reduction in the angle. So I got 103 degrees instead of 109.5. By the way, you can download these doozy handwritten notes on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. How about this question? Do you expect the molecular shape of SO2 to be bent? Yes or no? Also yes, and it looks like that. Here is another question. If three cars are worth 50 books, so how many books can we trade for 12 cars? Pause. Pause. Let's do it. Start with what we know. What we know is that three cars will give me 50 books and I want to trade for 12 cars. So this is what I begin with. 12 cars multiplied by my conversion factors. I want to put cars in the denominator and I know that three cars will give me 50 books. Why did I put cars in the denominators? To cancel this with this, so that at the end of the day, I have 12 times 50 over three books. Divide by three is one, divide by three is four. Four times 50 equals 200 books. So in order for me to get 12 cars, I need to give 200 books. Yet another question. If n is the principal quantum number, i.e. the shell number, then the number of subshells in each shell is... Please pause. Notice, here's the first shell, and it has one subshell. The second shell has two subshells. The third shell has three subshells. And the fourth shell has four subshells. Did you notice a pattern there? Yes, indeed. The answer here is N. In the first shell, I had one subshell. The second shell, I had two subshells. The third shell, three subshells. Fourth shell, four subshells. Next, in an electron shell that contains both S and F subshells, the ratio of S orbitals to F orbitals is what? Pause. Let's see what we have discussed before. Remember that the S subshell contains one orbital, which means two electrons. But the question is asking about the orbitals. Okie dokie, so S subshell has one orbital. How about the F subshell? It has seven orbitals. One orbital, seven orbitals. One, seven. So the ratio of S to F is one to seven. Because they ask me about the orbitals. However, what if the question asks me about the ratio of S electrons to F electrons? I'm talking about the maximum electrons. Well, since S has one orbital, it will carry two maximum electrons. And F has seven orbitals. Seven multiplied by two is 14. So the ratio will also be one to seven. Next, the maximum number of orbitals and the maximum number of electrons in the third electron shell, i.e. when the principal quantum number is 3 is pause remember the formulas if n is the shell number i.e the principal quantum number then the maximum number of orbitals is n squared and since each orbital carries a maximum number of two electrons therefore the maximum number of electrons is you just put this two right here 2n squared. Let's look at the third shell when n equals 3. When n equals 3, how many orbitals did we have? 9. We had 1 here, 3 here, and 5 here. 1 in the S subshell, 3 in the P subshell, and 5 in the D subshell, which means the maximum number of orbitals is 9. And the maximum number of electrons is 9 multiplied by 2 is 18 electrons. Here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So when n equals 3, maximum number of orbitals is 9, and maximum number of electrons is 18. 3, 9, 18. So the answer here is F, as in F me. Question number 91. What's the electron configuration for the following neutral atoms? Please pause. The first order of business is to find them on the periodic table. Here is iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. 26 electrons, 27, 28, 29, and 30. And then remember my mnemonic. S, S, PES, PES, DPS, DPS, F, DPS, as in F, me. This joke is getting old. So there you go. Iron, 26 electrons. So 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2. 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. And if you count all of them, you find the sum equals 26. And then how about cobalt? 3d7, amazing. Nickel, 3d8. Be very careful with stinking copper. 
It's not 4s2 3d9. It is 4s1 3d10. How about zinc? 4s2 3d10. There is nothing weird about zinc. The weirdo is copper. And if you remember my previous videos, chromium was another weirdo. We went 4s1 3d5. So both chromium 24 and copper 29 broke the off bow rule what is off bow off bow fill the low first you should fill the low energy before the high energy you should fill the 4s before the 3d subshell but chromium and copper said now we're not doing this we're going 4s1 3d5 and 4s1 3d10 respectively. Why is this nonsense? Because it has been observed that having half filled d subshell, i.e. 3d5, or a fully filled d subshell, i.e. 3d10, is more stable than having a full s subshell. Next question, can you arrange argon, neon, krypton, and hydrogen in order of increasing radius from lowest radius to highest radius, please pause. Remember your periodic trends. As you go downstairs, the atomic radius increases. So krypton is larger than argon, which is larger than neon, which of course is larger than hydrogen, which means the correct answer here is B. Next, in the two compounds below, what's the approximate bond angles between the terminal chlorine atoms? This is a very good question. Please pause and try to answer it yourself. First, what do you do? You draw the proper Lewis structure with the lone pairs if we have any. So, chlorine should have eight electrons now. So, it has one, two in the bond and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And each chlorine is like this. Let me just finish this nonsense. Okie dokie. How about phosphorus? Here is one, two, three, four, five, six, which means there is a lone pair right here. Let's do the other compound. All right, chlorine, nice. And the other chlorine, amazing. And the third chlorine, beautimus. And the last chlorine, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How about silicon? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It is octet. There is no need to add any lone pairs. Let's count the number of groups, electron groups. Here is one, two, three, four. So this compound has four electron groups. And all of them are bonded pairs of electrons. But how about this compound? Well, here is a group, second group, third group, and fourth group. We have three bonded pairs and one lone pair of electrons. So the total here is four and the total here is four. And if the number of electron groups is four, we expect the angle to be 109.5. And this is called the ideal angle. And it starts with the naive assumption that all of my pairs are bonded pairs. But, and that's a big but, if lone pairs exist, they cause angle distortion, i.e. reduction in the ideal angle. The angle will be lower than the ideal. So look at this lovely compound. Do we have any lone pairs? No lone pairs around the central atom, meaning I will have the ideal angle of 109.5. So it could be choice A or B or even E. Okie dokie, let's go to the other compound. We have one lone pair, which means the angle will be distorted and it will be lower than the ideal, less than 109.5 making E the correct answer. If you have any problems with this issue, please refer to video number 19 on VSEPR theory. Next, the following diagrams represent ground state electrons, i.e. electrons that are not excited, of some elements. Which one violates Pauli's exclusion principle? Please pause. What the flip did Pauli say? Pauli said, well, no two electrons can occupy the same, okay, yada, yada, yada. Therefore, if we have two electrons in an orbital, one has to be spinning positive half and the other has to have the opposite spin of negative one half. They cannot both look up and they cannot both look down. And of these choices, which one violates Pauli's exclusion principle? The answer is A, because look at this nonsense. Oh, positive and positive? That's a bunch of bilge water. Instead, one should look up and the other should look down. Next, which of the following violates Hund's rule? What did Hund say? 
Hund said, remember, Hund, have patience. Before you pair them up, make sure we fill everyone, one at a time, before you pair them up. So this is nonsense. If you have four electrons, here's one, two, three, and then you start pairing. So you put four here, and of course you have to put it in an opposite spin to make Polly happy. So which of these violated Hund's rule? And the answer is C. Before you pair them up, you gotta put them one at a time. So instead, this should have looked like this. Here is an orbital, an orbital, an orbital. One, two, three. There you go. This is proper. But this is nonsense. Question 96. If there are 20 million cars on Earth, each car drives a distance of 10,000 kilometers every year. And in order to drive just 10 kilometers, each car needs one liter of gasoline fuel. Each liter of gasoline fuel emits 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide gas. Please calculate the annual production of carbon dioxide in kilograms. Give me your answer in the proper scientific notation with two significant figures. Pause. Let's do it. I have 20 million cars. Zero, 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 zero. Cars. Nice. And after this, what do we have? Let me try to put one car in the denominator. Each car will drive for about 10,000 kilometers per year. Nice. And then each 10 kilometers will use one liter of gasoline. And after that, each one liter of gasoline is going to emit about 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Car is gonna cancel with car. Kilometer is gonna go to hell with the kilometer. And the gas will cancel with the gas. So the end result will be measured in kilograms of carbon dioxide per year which is exactly what they want. The rest is math history. In the proper scientific notation, it is 2.0 times 10 power 11 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year, i.e. annually. Okie dokie, let's look at the scientific notation. This m value has to be between 1 and 10. Is this between 1 and 10? Absolutely yes, so this is correct. Moreover, they want the answer in two significant figures. Here's the first significant figure, and here's the second significant figure. This nonsense is not significant. And here's the same answer in colors. Next, the element B, with five electrons and five protons, has two naturally occurring isotopes. The first isotope has a mass of 10.0129 atomic mass units. The second has blah 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 AMU. What is the percentage abundance of each of these two isotopes? Is it 98.4% and 1.6? Is it 92% and 8%? 30 and 70? 80, 20, or 50, 50. Please pause. This is a very important question. Let me remind you of a question that we have discussed before in video number 10. If 80% of all boron atoms have this AMU and 20% is this AMU, can you give me the average atomic mass? Remember how we did it? You get this 80%, which is 0.8 times its mass. Amazing. And the 20%, 0 0.2 times its 10, which is its mass. Don't forget the plus sign in between and don't forget your parentheses. When you add all of them, this is the average atomic mass for boron. Today's question is working this backwards. So let's do it. We'll suppose that the first isotope is X and the second is Y. And as you know, the percentage of X plus the percentage of Y have to equal 100%. So it could be 80-20 or 50-50 or 30-70. But X plus Y has to equal 100%, which is 1. Which means Y equals 1 minus X. Which means now the second isotope is called 1 minus x. Amazing. And I know that if I multiply the x by the first AMU, which is 10.129 AMU, and then plus y, I will not say y, I will say 1 minus x, it needs an extra parenthesis, multiplied by 11.0093 AMU, close this nonsense, all of this has to equal What's the average atomic mass of boron? They said 
10.81 AMU. The rest is algebra history. On this side, I have 10.0129 X plus one minus, okay, you get a multiplied by one first, so 11.0093 AMU, and then you multiply it by the negative X next, which means negative or minus 11.0093 X, amazing. And all of this nonsense equals 10.81 AMU. To make the algebra work, I will put this on the other side and change its sign and get the 10.81 AMU here by the minus sign. As for this number, it will go to the other side with a negative sign. So after rearranging the equation, it's going to look like this. I have all the x's on one side and all the amu's on one side. So here I have 0.9964x and here I have 0.1993 amu. I'll divide this side by 0.9964 and this side also by 0.9964, which means that x equals 0.20000 whatever, which means that this equals 20%. Aha! Uh -huh. If x is 20%, what do you think y is? It has to be 100% minus 20% equals 80%. So the answer is 80-20, which is choice D, as in doofus. Next, what are the stoichiometric coefficients in the aforementioned equation? Dang, when it's balanced, okay? So first we gotta do what? Balance the equation, let's go. So here I have two SBs, i.e. two antimonies. Let's try to multiply the left side by two so that I have two antimony atoms here and two antimony atoms here. So two and two. This part is balanced, but let's look at oxygen. I have two oxygen atoms and three oxygen atoms. Oh, that's nonsense. Whenever you see two on one side and three on one side, you multiply the two by three and you multiply the three by two. Okay, but now how many antimony atoms I have here? You have four, which means I gotta erase this two and write four antimony atoms here. Four antimony atoms, four antimony atoms. This is balance. How about the oxygen? Six oxygen atoms and two times three, six oxygen atoms. Bingo, I am balanced. What are the stoichiometric coefficients? Basically, these are the numbers of moles in front of each. So four, three, and two, which makes the correct answer C as in Celsius. Next, in a 3p orbital, which of the following sets of quantum numbers correspond to it? Okie dokie, please pause. First order of business, look at this number. Oh, that's the principal quantum number, which means n has to equal 3, which means c is a bunch of bilge water. c is impossible. They said 3p. Here's my 3p orbital. Okay, n equals 3. Nice. And here l equals 1. Oh, and m sub l is what? Negative 1 or 0 or positive 1. So n is 3, l is 1, and m sub l could be negative 1, 0 or positive 1. Which means the correct answer here is b, as in bore. Last question is your homework. Don't forget to balance the equation first. Let me know your answer in the comments. You will find the answer key in the next video in this glorious chemistry quick review playlist. If you find my videos helpful, smash like and get me a coffee. Thank you so much in advance. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 1,500 free videos on this channel, plus 300 premium videos for those wonderful people who click on the join button and choose the highest tier. Go to my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com to download my notes, cases, courses, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.